CKDJ1079. Welcome to the Press Box. There's only two of us today. It's, it's me, myself, RJ, Stacy, your host, as well as Tim Probert. How are you doing, Tim? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you? Pretty good. We're waiting for a good show. We got a lot to talk about. We got some NBA. We got some NHL. We got some NFL. And we're going to talk about the Jays a little bit as well. But right now, we are going to start off with our own Ottawa Skyhawks. They have a game tonight. We're going to get that to a second. But let's start off with their last game. Thursday night, loss to the Brampton A's, 115-111 after a strong performance by Ryan Anderson, but they couldn't make too many shots down the stretch. Tim, we were both at the game. What did you think about it? I thought it was a great game for them, obviously. I mean, the fan, there were a lot of fans there, so it was good, but, I mean, it's that's just it. As we said, they couldn't make shots down the stretch. They couldn't finish. They had their chance. It's not like they, weren't, they were out of the game completely. They only lost by uh, four points, but obviously it's kind of upsetting. I mean, they've played well against Brampton so far this year, so it's kind of a letdown, but hopefully they can rebound tonight. Yeah, it was definitely a little bit of a letdown when they lost that game. Uh, they got off to a quick start. Uh, Jermaine Johnson had a really strong first quarter. But the second quarter, they kind of they kind of tailed off a little bit and uh, couldn't really make any shots, and then they were kind of playing catch-up, and they couldn't quite make it back up. Uh, when they attacked the rim, they did a, they did a really good job. But um, hopefully hopefully they start doing that a little bit more tonight. Uh, going into to ga- today's game, they will be taking on the London Lightning. Not at the CTC tonight. They'll be at Segep. Latouille? Is that, is that pronounced correctly? Josep Lutoué. Josep Lutoué. Against, yeah, at 7.30, it'll be right here on CKDJ 107.9. The boys will have the call down at the arena. Uh, Tim, um, what do you think the keys are for the game tonight? Well, they actually won their last game against London. They've struggled against them this year. They're I'm pretty sure 1-4, one 1-3. And one and um, you can maybe quote that on me. I'm not sure. But obviously, that's just it. they got to make better shots. You said they were, they played a lot better down the post than they did. Obviously, you got to find your bigs, Baines and Johnson. you got to take smarter shots. They actually struggled a lot from the three during that game, which was their downfall. I mean, they, you see them going on fast breaks, taking threes and missing wide open three chances when you actually have to finish that. So I think, obviously, better quality of shots is key for them. But I think you got to use your bigs more, Johnson and Baines. Yeah, definitely the shot quality uh, the other day was not that great. There was a lot of long-distance threes. I feel like the best shots they get is when they get the penetration. They're able to get those kickouts for those wide-open jump shots as those are much more uh, high-percentage shots, and Anderson was able to knock those down last game. Yeah, that's just it. I mean, he is clearly their best shooter, so he's got to be hot. I mean, we've seen him struggle at times, but obviously since he is their best, you got to count on You have to give him the ball. It's just like any other team. If your best shooter is struggling... The other guy's got to pick it up, but you can't shy away from that. So he's going to be key for them tonight. Obviously, London is a strong team. They're a veteran team. They're clearly the two-time defending champions for a reason. So, I mean, it, they'll be in tough, but hopefully the atmosphere will be great. As you said, they're in Giuseppe Lutzewe, so it should be a full house. There are limited seats, so it should be a good game. Yeah, and they're at a new location tonight, just as you said. Uh, what do you think about the uh, the movement to the other to the new arena? I like it, obviously. Um, I like it, but I don't think it's going to be there for the long term. We spoke to Gus, actually, when he came on the press box uh, last Monday, I believe, and he said it wasn't a long term, it's just for now. Um, I think, personally, they're going to move to the Civic Center. I've talked to Gus and Juran Jackson about it, and they're almost positive that that will be their new destination because it's downtown and makes travel a lot easier for other people that are coming from the East End or downtown, so it should be easier. Plus, it is a smaller venue, so it won't be as hard to kind of fill the seats, which is good, but I'm looking forward to the game tonight. I mean, it's going to be a great atmosphere. It's going to be packed, so. Yeah, I'm excited for the game tonight. We're going to have the call here on CKDJ. Pre-game is going to start at 7 o'clock. The boys are going to have the call down at uh, down at the uh, the arena at 7.30 tip-off. So we're going to move on to some NBA right now. I got a nice little clip to share with you right now from the Raptors game the other night. That was Toronto Raptor Terrence Ross with two emphatic dunks back-to-back. He had a career-high 51 points. Yes, he did. At home against the Los Angeles Clippers the other night. Tim, what did you think about that game? Oh, it was just awesome to watch. The only downside was the fact that they lost the game. But if you look at the whole game itself, 
I mean, Raptor fans it clearly got their money's worth. It was it felt like a playoff atmosphere to me. I'm not sure how about like for you or anybody else, but that's clearly how I f- saw it. But Ross just putting on a show for the fans at the ACC, tying Vince Carter's 51 points. It's just awesome. The only downside, as I mentioned, was the fact that they lost. Yeah, what an amazing night from Terrence Ross. Uh, I remember a couple years ago, people Raptors fans were a little skeptical when we drafted Terrence Ross. Uh, Andre Drummond was still on the board, who's obviously turned out to be really good. And Terrence Ross wasn't one of the more well-known players in the draft, but uh, he's clearly panned out. I got a couple really nice stats about him, actually, about his game. Uh, he obviously tied Vince Carter's record for 51 points and um, as a team record. And another great stat is he became the 10th player, 22 years old or younger, to score 50 points in a game. And he's the first player ever to score 50 points in a game while averaging under 10 points a game leading into the game. I did not that. Know is a that. crazy stat. That is very crazy. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, I got, I, there's a lot of great hopes for Terrence Ross. Uh, sadly, DeMar DeRozan is, did injure his ankle, and he will not be playing tonight against the Brooklyn Nets. So uh, do you see Terrence Ross, after obviously his confidence is sky high, he had 10 threes, do you think him starting to take on a bigger role, especially with DeRozan out? I think he's going to have to. Obviously, Lowry is their point guard right now, so he's got to kind of dictate. But you see, if you look at Ross's shots in the last game, it's quality shots. He's not taking shots that are like five feet beyond the arc. He's not taking poor quality shots. They're all shots that he can make, and clearly that's why I put up 51 points. So I'm not looking for him to take every shot he can. Like Obviously, I don't want him to be a ball hog, but, I mean, with the performances he's had lately, I don't know how you can't give him the ball. So Yeah, he's playing with a lot of confidence right now, and that's one thing that he came in coming into the season. Obviously, he's got all those tools. He's, a, he's an amazing athlete. We saw him win the dunk contest last year, and he'll probably be in it again this year. And he's always one of the best shooters on the floor. So when you can jump higher and shoot better than everybody else on the floor, that's obviously a huge step for you. Uh, it was just a confidence thing. And the defense. The defense has been really good. Uh, what have you liked about uh, Terrence Ross and the defensive side of the ball? I just love his athleticism. As you mentioned in that cl- as you uh, showed the clip, there, you could clearly hear he goes down there and makes one dunk, gets all the way back down the court, gets a steal and goes back down and gets the other dunk. So it's clearly his athleticism, as you mentioned. But it's just the way he plays. He's clearly smart. I don't know, like, it's just, everyone is so skeptical about him, as you mentioned, but he's clearly outperformed him so far. I love how Dwayne Casey is starting him now, as opposed to bringing him off the bench, but he seems to be finding his groove right now. Hopefully with DeRozan, it won't impact him too much, but I think he's going to have to step up, and I think he will. So uh, it should be good for Toronto. Yeah, uh, Toronto's in a really good spot right now, third in the Eastern Conference, leading the Atlantic Division, one game above 500. Yeah, the Eastern Conference isn't great, but they've played a really tough schedule in the East, they played the Heat and, uh, Heat and Pacers quite a few times, and they've hung with them both tough. Uh, they hung tough with the, uh, the Clippers la- or the other night. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about the Toronto Raptors in general right now? Do you think they're definitely going to win the Atlantic Division, or do you think uh, a team like Brooklyn can sneak up on them? I think a team like Brooklyn could, but I don't think they will. I mean, Toronto is clearly the younger team, and they have some players that can play longer minutes. Obviously, DeRozan has shown that he can play longer minutes and making better shots, averaging 22 points a game. Lowry's been a stud for me. Yeah, ever I since, love Lowry. Ever since the talk of the train rumors, he's just been unreal for me. Ross, obviously, Valanciunas is starting to find his form, so that's good. And then you got your guys like Vasquez and Patterson and Salomons coming off the bench, and they're playing well. So I like where Toronto's at right now. Obviously, I'm not sure they can catch the Heat or the Pacers to get into that 1-2 spot, but if they can hold the third spot, then they, things look good for them for the playoffs because clearly they can beat any team in the East as they've done it with the Pacers and narrowly, as you mentioned, almost beat the Heat. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the trade, the Rudy Gay trade, where we received those four players from the Kings, uh, Vasquez, Hayes, Patterson, and Salmons. Um, I really like Patrick Patterson. He's, uh, he's been awesome coming off the bench as a, uh, as a big. He's able to make the jump shots. He's able to get great rebounds. He's, he's essentially, uh, he's, he's, he can start on most teams, yet he's our third big, which is a really good thing. Yeah, it's huge. Um, and another thing, uh, coming up, Kyle Lowry. You mentioned uh, how, you like it, how you like how he's been playing so far. Uh, the All-Star game is coming up. Do you see Kyle Lowry as an All-Star this year? I do. I don't think he will. Obviously, look at the talent of point guards in the East. I don't think he will. I don't know why he shouldn't be, obviously. But it's just, it's, uh, I think he should be. If you look at his numbers since the trade, he's kind of taking control of this team. He's averaging, I'm pretty sure, 16 points, like around eight assists and around six rebounds. So, and he put up a triple-double in the last game. Yep. So, I mean... He's clearly making a case for it. Whether he gets in or not, I'm not sure. But for me, I think he should be. 
Yeah, I think he's definitely deserving. Him, as well as DeRozan, probably has a, has a decent chance to make it as well, as DeRozan's really gotten a lot of hype because he is the big scorer on the team. Yeah. But I think Kyle Lowry has really been the keys to this team so far. His defense is great. He can score when he wants to, but he does a really good job of getting everybody involved in the game. Yes, he does. And he's a great rebounder for a point guard. Yeah. So um, he, he's definitely been amazing. So we're going to move ahead to some other NBA action. It has just been scoring like crazy lately. Yes, it has. Start off with Carmelo Anthony. 62 points, or 61 or 62? 62? 62. Yeah, 62 points, which is most in the history at the Garden. What did you think of Carmelo the other night? Well, that's just it. 62 points. You passed Bryant 61 at the Garden, which was previous history. Now it's Melo. I mean, you look at the highlights. I mean, you knew it was going to be his night when he's sinking shots from half court. That just says it all, but you look at the quality of shots. Like, he literally steps over the line. You know he's got the ball, and he's just thinking, I'm going to make the shot. No confidence, nothing about dishing the ball. Second he got near the line, he'd shoot and he'd make the basket. It's just an unreal performance by him. But, yeah, it's just it's been crazy all over the whole league. But for Melo to do that in New York, in the Garden, to break history out of all the greats that have played this game is just unbelievable. Yeah, it was an amazing night for Carmelo Anthony, especially because the Knicks have really have really been surprisingly not good so far this year. Uh, uh, it was an amazing breakout game for Carmelo. What do you think the uh, do you think What do you think the problem with the Knicks has been so far? Is it just like the discipline things? Like J.R. Smith has been kind of a mess. Yeah. Uh, what do you, What do you think of the Knicks this year? I think it's they've kind of battled some injury problems, but they're starting to get their guys back together now. But yeah, I think as you mentioned, it's kind of disciplinary problems. That's just that's usually how it is. J.R. Smith, I don't know what he's really thinking. I mean, you have a chance with the Knicks, six man off the bench. Potentially, he could start if he cleans up his act, but Carmelo Anthony is clearly one of the, easily one of the top five players in the league. Probably one of the best shooters in the league. you got Tyson Chandler, an unreal big. you got Amara Sotomayor coming off the bench who could easily put up 15 to 20, 25 points if he wanted to. There's so much talent on that team, but for them to struggle like this, it's they got to clean up their act badly, or if they get in, they're going to be facing the Heat or the Pacers, and it's not going to look good for them. Yeah, that's definitely a team that can definitely beat anybody in the league, but they can lose to anybody in the league as yeah, well. that's just it. Injury problems, disciplinary issues, they, they've been tough. So we're going to move on to another high-scoring player, and this guy has been on a total tear since the beginning of the new year. Kevin Durant yes. has been on fire. So many 40-point games. He's got a 50-point game. Ever since Westbrook's gone down, he has put that team right on his back and they are going, and they are the number one team in the NBA Power Rankings right now and the top team in the Western Conference. What do you like about Durant and OKC, OKC Tim? I just love how he plays the game. He's got, this is his 10th straight game where he's had over 30 points, which is history. He's only six back, I'm pretty sure, of Michael Jordan. But you look at that stat itself, it just says it all. And as you mentioned, ever since Russell Westbrook went down, he's clearly put the team on his shoulders, just carrying them the whole way. But it's his quality of shots that he's taken. Everybody knows he can shoot the ball. It's... It's common sense, but the fact that he's shooting with confidence, that's just, it's its unreal to see. Because you see shooters, and sometimes when they struggle, they just go into ruts where they're like 5 of five of 15, 6 of 20, stuff like that. Durant hasn't had a game where he shot less than 58%. Yeah. And it's just an unreal stat to think of, and that's why he's averaging over 30 points in his last f- or 10 games. Yeah, Kevin Durant's been amazing. Uh, do you think he could finally dethrone LeBron James as the MVP this year? I think due to the Westbrook injury, I think he will. Obviously, LeBron is LeBron. He's the best player on the planet. I don't know if anybody else thinks so. For me, he is. Oh, yeah, he is. He is right now. Because of the Westbrook injury. But if Westbrook wasn't injured, then I don't think he would. But because he is, I think he will. Yeah, I I really think Durant's kind of moved forward because he's put that team on his back so, so much. And he's kind of been the most valuable player in the NBA since the West, since the Westbrook injury, as they've ju- as they've jumped into first place in the West, uh, in front of Portland and San Antonio, he's been on a scoring tear, and I don't, I think he's I think he's deserved it so far, and I think LeBron is finally going to be dethroned, which is obviously a, a huge feat because LeBron, you could he's going to be in the running every year. So on to another player that Kevin Durant called the best shooter of all time, Stephen Curry has, he looks he's look he's obviously the best shooter in the league right now. But uh, he might, he might, when it comes down to it, at the end of his career, he might be the best shooter of all time. But Curry's been on fire. What do you think about Golden State and Stephen Curry? I love Golden State. They're so fun to watch. You see that team from beyond the arc. Him and uh, uh, Clay Thompson. Clay Thompson yeah. from three are just unreal. They're easily they could knock down any shot that you give them. Curry for me, obviously getting the start of this year for the first time in his career is just 
he's unreal. And as you mentioned, as Durant said, one of the best shoot, the best shooter of all time. He's shown it this year. He's just knocking everything down. He's playing with such poise and such confidence that I think Golden State is a real threat in the West. I don't know if they have the depth to knock down teams like San Antonio or uh, Oklahoma City, but, I mean, the way they're playing, they are a huge threat, and their offense is just so good that I could, I feel that they can take out any team in the East or the West. Yeah, I really I really like Golden State. I think Andre Iguodala is a really big part of that game too, or that team too. I really, really like Stephen Curry. Uh, I think an underrated part of his game is his passing ability too. He has the ability to make so many like ridiculous shots, three pointers from one foot. Uh, he's got so many floaters in the lane, and because he's such a high scorer, he's got the ability to make those passes as well. Yeah. So he he's just been amazing. So we're about halfway through the season. Uh, what do you think? Uh, if you could, if you could guess right now, the Western and Eastern Conference champions, and then give me an NBA champion. Well, in the East, it's going to come down. I think it'll be between Miami and Indiana, unless an upset happens. Hopefully, Toronto can upset whoever they play. Hopefully, it's in, or hopefully it's Indiana because it seemed to fare well against them. I think for the East, it's probably going to be the Heat because LeBron yeah. is just going to go on a tear in the playoffs like he has the last two years. For the West, I'm going to go on a limb here and I'm going to say it's going to be Portland coming out of the West because Damian Lillard as well as Curry's been on a tear, and LaMarcus Aldridge is just a beast. Oh, he's been a beast. So I think for the West, it's probably going to be between Portland and I want to say San Antonio, but I feel Oklahoma City is going to sneak in there, but I think it'll be the Heat and Portland, and then I think LeBron will get his three-peat. Yeah, I, I really like the Heat in the East. Um, I like Indiana, but I don't think they can just score as well as the Heat can score yeah. at any time. And in the West, I think if Westbrook is healthy, I really like Oklahoma City. Yeah. But if Westbrook is not healthy, I'm all in with you on Portland. LaMarcus Aldridge is awesome. Uh, Damian Lillard is a, is improving. He's be, he's going to become a star. He's going to yes, become a star. He he's going to be an all star this year. Both of them are. And I really like Portland. Uh, Wes Matthews is a great shooter and defender. Nick Batum's been a huge for them too. So that, I'm really excited for the second half of the season and the All Star game. So it's going to be great. We're going to take a quick commercial break, but we're going to have some Blue Jays talk and some MLB talk as Love soon as it. we return. Not going. High and deep to left field. Upper deck home run for Encarnacion. Welcome back to the Press Box. This is your host, RJ Stacey, as well as Tim Probert. We just had some NBA talk, and we, what you just heard was Edwin, Edwin Encarnacion of the Toronto Blue Jays last year hitting a fifth deck home run off John Lester. And we're going to have some Blue Jays talk as well as some MLB talk. We know baseball is far away, but we're right in the middle of the signings this yep, year. spring training. What do, you, what do you think of the Blue Jays coming up this year? What do you think they need to do so far in this offseason? I think the Blue Jays, obviously, look at their starting uh, roster for playing or not pitching for the outfield. It's, it's pretty good. If obviously, if Bautista can stay healthy, I love their chances. Reyes as well. Their pitching for me is the biggest question, obviously, I'm sure yeah. it is for everybody else. You have Dickey, who is a horse. He can easily play 20, 25 games for them. Morrow, if he's healthy, I love Morrow. Burley is just a horse, obviously the best record on Toronto last year. And then that's that's basically it. You go there from there. You got Jay Hab, who could probably play fifth role. But I think for Toronto, they have to address their pitching. The, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Oh, uh, they're starting roster, so that's that's it for me. Yeah, the pitching is definitely definitely got to be uh, improved. Uh, I like I like Dickey. I think he's a solid starter. He can go many innings. Uh, he's not going to be what he was his mad magical season with the Mets, but he's going to still be able to win fifteen plus games and pitch a ton of innings for you. Same with Burley. He's going to pitch a ton of innings. Uh, Moro, he's got to stay healthy. Yep, definitely got to stay healthy. Uh, but, yeah, I think we definitely need to get a pitcher. We missed out on Matt Garza that when he sucked. signed with the, with the Brewers. Yeah. And a couple the, the last four names in, uh, in starting pitchers for uh, free agency right now, we got Irvin Santana, Ubaldo Jimenez, Bronson Arroyo, and A.J. Burnett are the final four pitchers. I think we really need to go for one of those. Is there any of those guys you like in particular? Well, you look at Burnett last year with the Pirates. So obviously, he started in Toronto. I would love to see him back with Toronto. I'm not sure if that'll happen because I think he will stay with Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh has become a perennial threat. For me, I think they've got to go for Santana or Jimenez. I mean, if you look at them over the last two or three years, they've been dominant. Yeah. Like, even though they've been playing on poor quality teams, like they've been dominant. So if Toronto could grab one of them and have a solid four and then have Hap or whoever Hutchinson or Drayback come in and get six yep. or seven games, they could easily be a threat 
in the East against the Yankees or Boston, but it's, that, that's just it. They need one of those guys to fill that fourth role. Yeah, I, I really do like Burnett. Uh, obviously, he's playing in the National League now, so his pitching, his stats look a little better, but he's thrown 200 strikeouts three times. He struck out 231 guys and won 18 games when he was with the Jays. Yep. Uh, and then he had another two great seasons with the Pirates uh, the last two years on a playoff team. So Burnett, I wouldn't mind going for him. But like you said, I think Jimenez and Santana are the guys. Uh, Jimenez had a really great year last year. Uh, he didn't get a ton of wins because he played in a poor team. But his, his stats are great. He's a real strikeout guy. Uh, and I think three or four years ago, he came second in Cy Young voting. Yep. And he was dominating. Well, yes, he had that no hitter. He had so many strikeouts. He had a great ERA and whip. Uh, I think I think he is the I think he's the number one guy we want to go for. And then Santana, and then Burnett, and then Arroyo. If we do miss out on all three of those guys, but I think we definitely need one of those four. Uh, what do you think of the the batting lineup that we have for the Jays? Well, I thought personally, I thought they were going to trade Bautista because of his yeah, injuries and maybe try to get a, a draft pick or another outfielder, but. If he can stay healthy, I love that 3-4 combination with him and Encarnacion. Because obviously you need Reyes to stay healthy. That's the biggest one at uh, the leadoff. And then you take your pick at number two. I don't know if you want to put Rasmus in there or put Lori Because they fared well when Lori was healthy and came back. Yeah. And then obviously after Encarnacion, you go from there. You probably put Rasmus or Cabrera there or as their 5-6 combinations. And then you have the bottom of the order. So... For me, obviously Toronto is a fast team. They're athletic, but if Bautista and Reyes can stay healthy, I like their chances. Yeah, and uh, one move they have made so far is they have replaced their catcher. JP here in Sibia is off to Texas, and we've brought in Deanna Navarro. I love it. I really like it too. Uh, what do you What do you especially like about it? I love the f- well. Aaron Sibia, he has put up home run numbers. We've seen him sc- or put up twenty twenty five home runs, but. His batting average is just, oh, oh, it's just horrendous. Like, yep. I'm not trying to say I could be the next Bautista, but I could probably bat better than <laughs> Aaron Seba the way he played last year. He was terrible. Even defensively, he only threw out four of 26 yep. batters. That can't happen. And I love Gianno Navarro. He is so clutch. He is a veteran. He knows what he's doing. He's not even that old either, which is even better. His batting average was great around, I think, two. 290, I want to yeah. say. It was, it was in the 280, 280 range, 290 yeah. range. So you know we have a good hitter with him. So I love it. I just, for me, that's their, obviously they got that acquisition, but they need another pitcher and possibly another outfielder. So, Yeah, I, th- I think the thing with Deion Navarro, the big thing for me is his ability to play defense as a catcher. Uh, J.P. and Steve's defense was horrendous. And when you're, when you're striking out that much, but you're not making up for it with your defense... You're, you're kind of not really helping out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He became the first player in MLB history to have 20 home runs and have an OPS under six, which is terrible. Yep. That's how much he struck That's out bad. and how little he got on base. So I really like Navarro. He was an all-star a few years ago with Tampa Bay. Uh, he's a great defensive catcher. So I really like that signing. But uh, like you said, I think we need, we might need to get another outfielder. Uh, we need to see if Anthony Ghost can step up. Yep. Uh, we lost Rajay Davis, so maybe he that's, can step into yeah, a Rajay Davis that's, role. That's a big loss for me. Obviously, we're going to Detroit, so that makes them an even bigger threat than they already are. Yeah, I really liked Rajay Davis, especially on the turf. He was running all over yep. it last year. And he, he did bat a little better than we expected, too. He was really great against left-handed pitching. So we're going to need to see if uh, Anthony Ghost can replace him. Uh, do you, what do you think about Anthony Ghost and, uh, and the other prospects that we have? Maybe the pitching prospects, too. What do you think about them? Well, Anthony Ghost, obviously, you see him when he's playing. He's easily one of the fastest players on the team. Oh, yeah. Him and Rajay Davis, when he got them in the same game, if they were on base, like, they were a threat. You could see, you, just, you saw pitchers throw back so much against them. For me, for Ghost to play better, he's just got to be more patient at the plate. For me, he takes swings at balls that he shouldn't be, but that's obviously because yep. he's young. So, for... For him to be successful, he's just got to be patient up there, up at the plate, and just relax a little bit more. Obviously, that'll come with the experience, but for me, he's probably their biggest asset that they need to get him going like this year. Yeah, I really think he does too. He's really going to have to, like you said, his uh, his uh, ugh, his selection at the plate definitely got to improve because his batting average isn't great. But what he needs to do is he doesn't need to hit home runs. He needs to walk. He needs to get singles and doubles and get on base. Because when he gets on base, he could steal all the way around if he wanted to. He's that fast. And another thing, like you said earlier, we need Jose Reyes to definitely stay yeah. healthy. So moving on to another uh, another player. Masahiro Tanaka of Japan signs with the New York Yankees. Who else other than the New York Yankees? Just typical. Became the fifth highest pitcher in the MLB already. 
despite not throwing a single pitch. Marissa what do you what do you think about that signing there, well, Tim? We've seen that signing. Obviously, it's paying off so well with Texas with you, Darvish, but we've seen it before with uh, Medeki Matsuyama with Boston, and he I don't even know if he's even playing right now because he's battled with injuries. But I mean, for me, if you look at Mashiro's stats last year, twenty four and zero. 1.27 ERA. I mean, that's just that's just unheard of. Yeah, it's sick. But obviously, coming from Japan, coming over here, it's going to be a, a lot bigger of a difference. I mean, playing in New York, the East is not an easy place to hit or to pitch against. You've seen Boston. East, Boston's clearly one of the better hitting teams. Toronto can be if their players stay healthy. So I think it'll be interesting for sure. It's obviously a huge gamble, as you mentioned, the fifth highest salary for pitchers, but... I mean, if it does work out for them, then watch out for the Yankees. But if it doesn't, that's just a lot of money thrown to waste. Yeah, it's a big risk for sure. He's got so much uh, potential, but he also, he's such an unknown coming from Japan. He's not an unknown, but you never know how he's going to be able to pitch against MLB hitters because yeah. he's only ever played in Japan. Well, yeah, that's so, just it. So you're paying him a lot of money to just hope that he's that good when he could just be playing against lesser competition. So I'm not really, I'm not really sure he deserves. Let's look at, let's look at this. Does he really deserve that much more money than someone like Matt Garza? No, I don't think so. And that's what you that's what you know I've been saying. I think Toronto should have made the stab at him, but for not even throwing a pitch in the MLB, I just I don't know how you can waste that kind of money on him. Yeah, that's just seems like something that the classic New York Yankees do though. They just throw money at you and hope that uh hope that you can, can uh be what they expect you to be or hope that you can be. Yeah. Uh so let's uh both we just talked to uh, we just talked about two American League East teams. What is your prediction for the American League East? Do you think the Yankees, Red Sox, Orioles, Jays, or Tampa Bay? I think the Yankees are going to struggle this year because Jeter is not 100% right now. A-Rod's not even playing this year. Cano was gone. Euclid is gone. Like They have a lot of players that are missing right now, so I think they're going to struggle. Baltimore, for me, last year for them was a disappointment, obviously besides Chris Davis with his unreal home run number. I think it's going to come down to Toronto and Boston, or at least I'm hoping it will, because Toronto has the potential. We've seen them beat Boston, take series from Boston. So if their players can stay healthy, I love Toronto and Boston, and I think Toronto can squeak by them if their players can stay healthy and if they get another pitcher. Yeah, I I really want to hope for the Toronto Blue Jays. Obviously, we're Jays fans, so we really want to see it. Last year, after that big trade where they got all those assets, they got Reyes, they got the pitchers, uh, we're, we're essentially the same team. We're just... Missing Josh Johnson now, yep. who obviously was terrible. So everybody thought they were going to win the American League East last year. Everybody thought they had a great chance at winning the World Series. So what do you think is going to be different this year coming into the season for the Jays? I think that they're going to be, for me, the difference is going to be that their training aspect because clearly their training last year, they got injured way too easy. Oh, yeah, for sure. But for me, it's just going to be more patient at the play. They're prob- I think they're going to have to play better on the bases. Like They were clearly one of the better base-running teams of the league, and they didn't even do it that much. Yeah, Raji had, I think, in between 38 or 45 steals last year and the year before that, and whenever I saw him in games, it didn't even, even look like he was doing it. He's one of the fastest players in the league. I don't know how you cannot have him stealing almost every game. You saw when John Farrell was on there, they would steal in the first inning with nobody out just to get runners in scoring position. That's what I think they're going to have to do. They're going to have to score probably, I want to say, in between four and six runs a game if they're going to want to have a chance yep. to compete against teams like Boston, maybe the Yankees or Baltimore or anybody else in the East. Yeah, I think I think the base running is definitely a big issue. And I think another issue for the Jays last year was they went too often for the home run. Yep. Uh, a lot of long balls. Obviously, when it's working for you, you're going to put up a lot of numbers. But when it's not working for you, you get the strikeout numbers that we had last year. Well, that's just it. As you mentioned, sorry to cut you off there. Oh, Aaron okay. Sebia is just hurt. That's what he, I hated him for that. You'd have guys on first or second or guys in the corners, guys on second or third, even bases loaded. And he's swinging three pitch strikeouts, swinging for the fences. I don't know what he's yep. doing. You hit a single, you're going to score at least one, probably two, maybe even three if Raji's yeah. on first. Yeah. It's just brutal watching. Even Bautista was doing the same thing. Yeah. And you got guys like Encarnacion that are going up there, and they're taking slices, getting that single, getting the ball in play, and picking up the RBIs. That's why he had over 100 RBIs again last season. Yeah, I really, really like Edwin Encarnacion. He was, de- in my opinion, definitely their best player oh, last by year. Far. Because his shots are, not shot selection, swing selection is really good. Yep. He's got a great eye for the plate, and he walks, too. Yep. So he's and he got his 40 home runs. Mm-hmm. He hit singles. He batted near 300, but he didn't swing for the fence every time. But he's got so much power, he's going to connect on good pitches, and he's going to hit his home runs. Exactly. So hopefully that's going to be something that the Blue Jays do this upcoming season. Let's hope anyways. Yeah.
We're going to take another quick commercial break. Then we're going to be back with some Pro Bowl and Super Bowl picks as well as some NHL talks. So stick around. And on first and ten, now you get a flea flicker. And Luck is going to go deep into the end zone. And it will be taken there by Deshaun Jackson of the Philadelphia Eagles for the touchdown. Welcome back to the Press Box. It is me, RJ Stacey, your host, as well as Tim Probert. We've talked MLB, we've talked Jays, we've talked Raptors, we've talked Skyhawks. Now it's time to talk about some NFL. That clip right there was the flea flicker in yesterday's Pro Bowl game from Andrew Luck to Deshaun Jackson. The Pro Bowl, uh, the Pro Bowl was pretty good. Uh, what did you think about it, Tim? For me, obviously, the NFL wanted to get more, more of a, I guess, a, an excitement to their Pro Bowl because obviously it's not really that exciting lately. They changed the rules. They made a, a new kind of a draft format, which obviously was more exciting than previous years. I thought it was a good game. I mean, 22-21, you can't really argue with the score. A lot of key plays, a lot of trick plays. But for me, the thing that really made me happy was the fact that the players were actually trying. Like you saw some players from their own team hitting their star players. You saw Jamal yeah. Charles take a headshot, kind of a controversial play there. I hope he's all right, obviously, taking that shot from his own player. But then you saw guys going end over end, trying to make plays. Josh Gordon got flipped upside down by his own line. Yeah, by so. his own teammate, yeah. yeah so it's just, I thought it was a good game. For me personally, yeah, I really, I really liked it. I think the whole uh, team Dion versus team Rice thing is a cool idea. Uh, after last night's game, uh, obviously the Pro Bowl in the past hasn't exactly been the most uh, exciting of All Star games. Yep. Do you think uh, if they continue doing things like like playing hard like last night and continue doing this draft thing, do you think it's got a better future? I think it does. I mean, for me, the, like all these like Pro Bowls, I guess the NBA All Star game, the NHL All Star game. I don't really, I'm not really too fond of them. The only one I am really fond of is the MLB. Because yeah. it has something meaningful. Yeah. The winner of the NL or the East gets home field advantage. I mean, you can't really do that for football because if Team East wins, you don't really know who's going to get it. Yeah. Obviously, this year, if it was somewhere in the AFC, it'd be in Denver, which is a huge disadvantage for Seattle. But if it was the other way, it'd be even better for Seattle. So I don't really know how you can change that for them. But I love the format. As we mentioned, the game yesterday, for me, was fun. It was a lot of fun. There were a lot of players. The players were actually trying, which is the biggest thing for me. But it was just entertaining. You could clearly see the crowd, even though it was raining, and they were still into the game, so it was fun. Yeah, I really liked it also. I thought that uh, the fact that people were trying, like you said, you can pull, still pull out the trick plays in the Pro Bowl, like we just listened to the Luck Flea Flicker to Deshaun Jackson. It's still an all-star game, so you're still out there having fun, and you're still. Uh, and I like that the fact that they play hard, too, because you yep. can obviously see in some all-star games that people just coast. They let people score touchdowns. They let people score baskets. They let people score goals. Not much defense is really played. So I really like the fact about the uh, that they were playing a lot harder yesterday because it was a low scoring game for an all star game. Yeah, that's surprising. Twenty two to twenty one. Uh, wh- I know. I know. Um, wh- which team do you think was was better? Which do you think had more talent on it? I think Team Rice had more talent on it. I mean, if you look at their players, it. W- I think they were the better team for me. Obviously, Nick Foles did a lot for yep. Tim Sanders. He won the offensive MVP. He didn't even throw a pick, whereas other guys, you know, all the other quarterbacks threw at least one. So that's kind of the biggest thing for me. And then Derek Johnson, T. Yep. Rice. You can't. Oh, I don't even know. You can't even talk enough about him winning Defensive Player of the Year or winning the Defensive Award for the Pro Bowl. So, but yeah, I think Team Rice had the better players. Unfortunately, they didn't. Uh, lost my train of thought there. I was going to say, unfortunately, they didn't. Played too well, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, low scoring games are obviously a lot better than shootouts. I'm sure most people yeah. would like to see a shootout, but the fact that it was that close, it was good, especially with Team Rice going down in the last minute and scoring on that two point conversion yeah. by Mike Tolbert. Yeah, that was a really great play. Um, the fact that they went for two for the win was pretty cool. Uh, did you did you see Nick Foles as kind of the standout MVP of the game last night? I did. I mean, that's just how I say. He didn't even throw a pick during that game, whereas all the other quarterbacks did for me. I loved. Cam Newton in that game. He yeah, me was too. So funny to watch in that game. I just love the way he played. But for me, Phillips Philip Rivers was a class act, told the guys to give Mike Tolbert the ball, even though they're not even on the same team. And Tolbert obviously went in there and scored the winning convert. So it was good to see. Yeah, it was awesome. I thought Nick Foles played really well. Obviously you mentioned Derek Johnson, Mike Tolbert, and obviously it's just a fun atmosphere. So everybody has a lot of fun. Jimmy Graham dunked on Eric Weddle after his yep. touchdown, which was awesome. So it was a really cool game. And I think the Pro Bowl is gonna be a lot better in the future. So, moving over to the other bowl game, the Super Bowl coming up this Sunday. Both Denver and Seattle arrived in New York. And uh, quick little preview, Sherman's interview uh, 
how he was respectful of the Broncos and Tom, Thomas's comments on hoping that he's matched up against Sherman. So do you think he's stating there that he's the best against the best right now? I think he is. I don't think he's saying it in a cocky way because obviously yeah. Sherman is clearly, for me, the best or a corner in the game and if you look at Demarius Thomas this year and obviously in the playoffs he's got like 168 receiving yards two touchdowns just a beast running the routes and running the plays but for me for him to say that is it's a compliment for Sherman like I said he's not meaning any disrespect by it because he feels that Sherman is the best so for me that's the key matchup to watch but obviously the matchup itself is going to be can the Broncos stop Seattle's Marshawn Lynch when he goes into beast mode and can Seattle's unreal corners and safety stop Denver or Peyton Manning when he's throwing the ball? So Yeah, that's the big thing. The number one defense versus the number one offense in the NFL. You can't really script it up better than that. Nope. Uh, what, do you, what Do you see? Do you think Peyton Manning's going to have a huge day against Seattle or do you think Seattle's going to be able to stop him? I think he's going to have a, a good day. I wouldn't say a huge day. I don't know. I don't think he'll throw over 400 yards because I don't think the weather is going to allow him yeah. to. But I think he is going to get his second Super Bowl. Obviously, we'll explain. I'll explain more why on the Friday. But for me... Seattle's offense doesn't seem to have the kind of talent, obviously, that Denver has. Nobody does. But their offense has struggled this year. And recently in their last few games, Marshawn Lynch has kind of put the ball or kind of put the team on his shoulders going into those beast modes. But Percy Harving is questionable. I don't even know if he's going to play. Sidney Rice isn't even going to play. Unless Baldwin can have another 155-yard game and do 130 yards on kickoff returns, I don't really know how Seattle can score. Probably... 25 points to hang with Denver. Yeah, I agree with that. I think uh, Denver's just got a little bit too much firepower because you said uh, Sherman hopes he, or Sherman and Thomas are probably going to be matched up the entire game. But the fact that Denver's got so many other options, they got Decker, they got Welker, they can still give the ball to Marino, uh, they got Julius Thomas. There's just too much offense there to go around. Yep. So uh, it's going to be a great game. And I also read something. Uh, because the game is being played in New York, Eli Manning has given uh, Peyton Manning some tips about the stadium. Oh, really? What do you What do you think of that? I th- obviously it's brotherly love. I don't I don't mind that at all because he, both have played against the Giants, and obviously Peyton Manning needs that experience in MetLife. He played there earlier this year, but it clearly wasn't the weather conditions that it is on Sunday. But I'm sure Eli probably gave him some tips or what he saw in that Seattle uh, defense. Obviously, I don't think I don't think Manning wants to have that same performance, throwing five interceptions. Yeah, but. I mean, it's good for Manning, for Eli, excuse me, to tell Peyton or I guess give him some advice on the stadium, maybe the win yardages, maybe some things that he saw in that Seattle secondary or even on defense when he was watching. So I think it's good, but obviously it's gonna. we'll see on Sunday if it works. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I really, I, I really uh, like, like I kinda, sorry, I really like it because uh, I think uh, I read that Peyton did the same thing for Eli Manning when Eli was playing in Indianapolis. Oh. So uh, hopefully... The, uh, the same thing happens here. Um, final prediction, and who is your Super Bowl MVP? Well, obviously, we'll talk more about it on Friday, but for me, it's I think it's going to be, I don't want to say high scoring or, or a blow, but I think it's going to be a lot more of a gap than people think it's going to be. I think it's going to be around, I'm going to say around 20, 28 to 14 for Denver. I don't think Seattle has enough to hang with Denver, obviously, unless Lynch can have that kind of a day. And I think the MVP probably is going to be Peyton Manning because yeah. he's just going to dictate the whole game. I don't, I don't think he's going to throw a pick at all in this game unless it's due to the weather or unless something miraculous happens. But I think he'll probably just go out there, have a clutch game, not just control the ball, have those seven-minute long drives that we saw against New England, and yep. just dictate the whole play. Yeah, I agree with that. I have uh, I have Denver in this game too, and I think Peyton Manning will win the uh, Super Bowl MVP for the second time, and he'll get his second Super Bowl. I'm thinking around. I think it's going to be not too low scoring, but right in the middle area, like you said. But I think it's going to be a little bit closer. I'm going to go with 24 to 17. Ooh. So a seven point game. I, like I think. It. I think what I'm, I think what we might see it might come down to a Peyton Manning last uh, last minute touchdown or field goal. I think it's going to be closer throughout the entire game, and Peyton Manning is going to drive him down the field and win a close game. And another question about this: uh, Peyton Manning, if he wins his second Super Bowl and wins another MVP, where do you think he ranks all time? I was waiting for that question. Um, you look at his, if you look at his stats through his whole year, four-time MVP, obviously he's got the one Super Bowl, has struggled a bit in the playoffs, obviously he's played well this, or this postseason, but it's just his stats itself, I mean, at 38, he's threw for over 5,400 yards this year, 55 touchdowns, most all-time out of all the great quarterbacks, yep. obviously some played uh, fewer games and stuff, and obviously the players, or the equipment is better this, or in this decade than it has been in the past few, but... 
For me, if he gets that second one, he will be in that discussion. Obviously, him and Brady are one, two in that discussion. But I don't think he's the best of all time right now. He's He's easy, he easily could be, but for me, I don't think he is. But I think if he gets his second, though, that's all they're going to be talking about probably for the next year. Yeah, it's definitely obviously a, a debate that can go either way. I think the top three are those two and uh, Montana. Uh, but I think I think because uh, Brady's got three Super Bowls. If Manning gets his second, there has been talks if he wants that that he may or may not retire. But he did mention that he doesn't plan on it. Yeah. So I think he really wants to catch Brady for three. Yep. If he does win his second, uh, I personally. I'm I'm on the Peyton Manning bandwagon here. I do think he's the best quarterback of all time because his stats are so great. Yep. Uh, he just had the greatest single quarterback season of all time. He's two and two against Brady in the playoffs now. So uh, a lot of it has to do with people didn't think he could win the big games, but if he does go in and he wins the second Super Bowl, I think you definitely got to put him up there. Oh, for I, sure. Obviously, he's up there, but uh, I think you absolutely have to put him first if if he does win his second yep. Super Bowl and even a third. But yep. that, that's obviously just my opinion. Brady's obviously one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. And you're going to get some of those guys that say Montana as well. But uh, I, I, I do think it's Peyton Manning, but obviously you can go either way. Yep. So we're going to move along now to some NHL action. We're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to start off with the Winnipeg Jets. Ooh. What do you think of them so far? I love the way they're playing this year, obviously, or this year, their last seven games, excuse me, with the hiring of Paul Maurice. Obviously, you saw him on Toronto. They had the 4-1, or on Toronto, on Saturday against Toronto. They had the 4-1 lead. Kind of blew it, but then obviously finished with a overtime win scored by Dustin Bufflin. But their game yesterday against the Blackhawks, like the best team for me in the NHL, in Chicago of all places, and coming out with a win in regulation speaks for itself. I mean, Al Montoya, where did we where even talk about yeah. him? 34, sh- 34 saves, only one goal allowed. Just unreal play by them. But and then you go you look at Blake Wheeler. I mean, ever since he's been not, or ever since he's been listed at on the U.S. Olympic team, he's just been on a tear. But for me, the Jets are a threat right now. Obviously, they just got over 500 for the first time in a long time this yep. year, 25 and 24, and a couple of OT losses. So they are a threat if their defense can play the way they have been, and obviously if Paul Maurice can keep this hot streak going. So I lo- love the way the Jets are playing. Yeah, I like the way they're playing a lot too. They just got over 500. They're creeping in on Minnesota for that eighth spot. Not quite too close yet, but they're they're making their way up there. And uh, since Paul Maurice, they've been on fire. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, Dustin Bufflin moving from defense yep. to forward. Yep. Uh, that's definitely helped him out a lot. He's he's still playing a little bit of defense, but the fact that he's primarily moved to playing forward, I think that's helped out a lot. What yep. do you think about that move? Well, that's just it. As you mentioned, you can play either or, but even when he's playing, even when he's on defense, he still plays like a forward. Yeah. So you can cl- easy, cl- easily classify him as that fourth forward from the point because of the way he plays. I mean, you look at his goal against Toronto. It was four-on-four four action. He just went end-to-end and came across the blue line and took that blistering wrist shot top corner. So he hits. He's aggressive. He's obviously a leader, and he can score. So that's clearly a key factor for Winnipeg if they're going to want to compete. Obviously, they just as I mentioned, they got the big win against Chicago in Chicago. So... That's a huge momentum builder for this team, and Paul. I like the way Paul Maurice is coaching them right now. Yeah, I relate the way Paul Maurice is coaching them too. There's so much talent on that team as well. Like you said, with Wheeler, Bufflin, and and the goaltending has been awesome as well. Yep. So there's a lot of talent on that team. They were really struggling early in the year, and uh, I think I think Paul Maurice has done an amazing job with them. Do you think Do you think you have to give a real lot of credit to Paul Maurice, or do you think they were just struggling early on? I think they were just struggling. Obviously, Paul Maurice with the new coaching uh, change up. I'm sure the players felt that they weren't safe either, so maybe they're playing at a higher level. But the way Paul Maurice has been coaching has been good for them. He's not even signed right now, so if I'm the Jets, I'm looking to sign him to at least another year and possibly a long-term contract because the way he's playing, he's clearly casing himself to become a coach again for the future for another team if he doesn't sign with Winnipeg. So if I'm the Jets, I'm signing him as soon as I can. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. We're going to move over to another team now. The Anaheim Ducks have the best home record in the NHL, top two team in the league right now with Chicago, and you could classify them as the best team in the league right now for sure. They have been on fire what do you think about the Ducks? I just love the way they're playing. Even as you mentioned at home, I don't think they've lost a the game yet at home. I'm pretty sure they're over 20 wins and zero losses at home, which is just yeah. an unreal stat to think of. So if they do get first overall and first in the West, I wouldn't want to go to Anaheim for four games and try to beat the Ducks yeah. there. Um, just the way Getzlav and Perry are playing together. I mean, I'm sure they'll be Olympic line mates in Sochi. Yeah. I hope they will be anyways. I don't know how you can break them up the way they're playing. But they, if you look at Getzlaff's stats, he's in the top five for scoring. Perry is in the top, I think, 
12 for scoring as well. So that's just unreal. Their goaltending has been unreal as well. You saw them in the uh, the outdoor game on Saturday, the way that they started and the way they played. Perry and Guess I've got it started right away, scoring like three minutes into the game. So they are a huge threat. Obviously, them and Chicago are the biggest threats in the West with Pittsburgh in the East. But for me, I think if the Ducks can keep playing the way they are at home, I don't know how you don't like the Ducks' chances going into the playoffs. Yeah, I just read right now, actually, Corey Perry and Ryan Getzlaff are both top five in scoring. Totally. So you when go. you can have two players on the same team in top five in scoring, you're obviously going to be very difficult to stop. Yep. Corey Perry is also top three in goals scored with 28. He's just a beast. So he's just been amazing. He's, he's, won, uh, he's won the Hart Trophy in the past. He might be on his way to another one, too. Him or Getzlaff both have... Uh, a great shot at that because of how good they've both been playing and, yeah. Han- and Anaheim has been playing. If you could pick right now, who do you think would be the Hart Trophy winner? For Anaheim or for the league? For, for the league in general, sorry. Uh, that's, that's a good question. Obviously, everyone talks about Sidney Crosby, the way he's playing right now, but he does have that power play, which is just deadly. So when you have guys like Malkin, Latang, or Kunitz, and Neal that play on that first line, it's kind of easy to get assists when all of them are scoring. But for me, I... I'd probably say Crosby at the way he's playing. He's just he dictates every play when he's on the ice. He can score. He passes. He hits when he wants to. He's just great down low. I love Getzlav. I think Getzlav is a close second for me. Just the way he plays, the way he style. He fights when he has to. He's a good leader. He's aggressive. He's a good skater, and he can score. Like that's just that says it all. Him and Perry playing together. I mean, you look at them at the Olympics. If you put another skill obviously all of team canada's skill but if you put another key player with that line you have their two their two grinders their two good skaters their two goal scores and their two point getters they're like that it's just a deadly combination but i'll say crosby's probably my heart trophy winner right now yeah crosby crosby definitely seems like the pick he's leading the league in scoring he's the he's he's, he's the face of the nhl yeah. he's the star of the league he's been amazing but uh i'm not gonna go with crosby i am gonna go with ryan Getzlaff. Ooh. uh I, I do think Crosby's obviously one of the favorites, but I think they're one two for sure. Yep. Uh, but I, I really, I really do like Getzlaff a lot. He's uh, he's been amazing so far this year, scoring and uh, and with the assists. Him and Perry have been amazing. He's kind of helped turn Andrew Cogliano into a. He's he's been really good as well. Yeah. So I'm gonna go with Ryan Getzlaff, but uh, I wouldn't obviously wouldn't be shocked if Sidney Crosby won it. Yeah. So or even John, I would I could throw John Tavares in there. John as well. Tavares, he's yeah. Carried the Islanders this year. He's played great as well. Yeah. So. John Tavares, uh, Ovechkin's always gonna be a candidate. Yep. Uh, Patrick Sharp's been amazing. Oh, he's been clutch. Yeah. And and Corey Perry as well. So Corey Perry's been amazing. I have Corey Perry on my fantasy team. So <laughs> obviously I know how good Corey Perry's been so far this yeah, year. Yeah. I have Getzlaff on mine. Yeah. So uh, obviously we're both uh, doing pretty well with that. So we're going to move on, finally, to our thumbs up and thumbs down. What's your thumbs up right now, Tim? I'm going to go over to the golf side with Brad Fritch and Graham Dillette, the two Canadian boys. Fritch from Manitick, Dillette from Alberta. They finished one or a second and tied for ninth, respectively. Dillette obviously tied for second yesterday. Had a chance for a playoff until uh, Stalling sunk that birdie punt in 18. Now Dillette with a strong showing, one under... 71 to post tied for nine, so a good payday for him and a good payday for De- for Dillette. Yeah, I really like Graham Dillette. Uh, he's obviously the top Canadian right now. Uh, do you see him winning any big tournaments this year? Do I you think, think he's, he's got a big shot at any? I think he's going to win at least one. I would like to see him cont- or contend in the majors. I don't know if he will this year because he hasn't shown that he can finish yet, but he almost won last year. He almost won again yesterday, or well, he had a chance to win yesterday, so I think he's going to win at least one this year, hopefully two, but I think he'll win one this year. Uh, you mentioned the majors, staying on the major side there. Is this the year Tiger finally gets it back? I think he is. I love him at the Masters. If you look at him last year, if he wouldn't have hit that flag stick at Augusta last year, he would have birdied there and put himself a two-shot lead. And with 16, 17, and 18, could have easily birdied one of those yep. two and had a three-shot lead on a Saturday. So I like to see him there. But I don't know. Obviously, if he wins there, everyone's just going to be frothing at the mouth yep. because he's going to get that 15th and he's going to be three back at Jack. Yeah, I agree. So we're going to go to my thumbs up now. I'm going to go to the tennis side of things. A little Aussie Open. I'm going to go with Stanislas Wawrinka, who moved up from number eight in the world to number three in the world. Finally, somebody beats the top four. Yep. He defeated Rafael Nadal. Nadal was a little hurt, but Stanislas Wawrinka obviously had a great, great match. He moved up to third in the world, and he's now the highest ranked Swiss player which is higher than Roger Federer. Yeah, Federer. He was the first player ever to, or Walrenko was the first player to ever beat Djokovic and Nadal in a uh, 
playoff grand slam or a tennis grand slam. Yeah, and uh, the last 34 of the 35 majors had been won by one of those big four, Nadal, Djokovic, Federer, and Murray. And I think Warinka has definitely moved into that little elite class as he's now third in the world. Yeah, it is. So we're going to go to your thumbs down. What do you have? My thumbs down is going to be the Spurs Heat game yesterday. Obviously, as you mentioned, a playoff potential final again this year. I thought it would be more of a playoff atmosphere, but it was actually kind of a letdown. The Heat just kind of walked all over San Antonio, and you know it was a letdown when... LeBron didn't even have to play in the fourth corner and still won by double-digit scoring, as well as the fact that Parker, Ginobili, and Tim Duncan didn't even have to play in the fourth quarter as well because they were so far out of it. So that is my thumbs down. Yeah, it was definitely a surprising game for me as well. Uh, I saw it being a, like a playoff matchup, a potential NBA championship matchup right there, and the Heat kind of just walked all over them, which kind of does show what the Heat's dominance can be when yep. they really want to give it a shot. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to go with my thumbs down. It's going to go to the AP poll in NCAA basketball Ooh. for ranking Creighton only 20th. Really? Which is surprising. At 17-3, and three, oh. they killed Villanova in oh. Villanova, who is, who, is, who is in the top 10. How they are they ranked that beat low? beat Georgetown. Doug McDermott is the best player in the nation right yeah. now, and they've just been amazing. They're ranked 20th. I think they should definitely be in the top 15. Easily. Uh they got teams like Cincinnati's in there. Cincinnati's been good, but I think Creighton's been better. Iowa, uh, Wisconsin's obviously dropped off since their hot start. So I think Creighton is getting uh, the shaft a little bit right yeah, now. So um, I, th- I think hopefully they continue it up and get can get a two or three seed in the March Madness, as that would be great. Yeah, it definitely would be. Obviously, McDermott's just been on a tear lately. He's sinking threes, knocking down shots, playing at a force. That's just unreal. As you mentioned, uh, number best player in the nation right now. Yeah, I agree. I think he's definitely got to be the favorite for that, averaging over 25 points, 8 rebounds a game, and also being dynamite from 3-point range. So that is your show, ladies and gentlemen. For Tim Probert, I am RJ Stacey, your host. Thank you for tuning in uh, to the Press Box on 107.9 CKDJ. Remember to tune in tonight to the Ottawa Skyhawks game starting at 7 o'clock with the pregame. We will be here on the panel, and the boys down at the arena will have the call for you. So thank you very much, and have a good night.